Hello and welcome back, Royal Family. It is the 16th of April, Year of Our Lord 2024. Your date is 4-16-24. You know, I received just in the last week, very interesting, um, two people have sent me videos and another person sent me an email and it's all pertaining to the same stuff, which um, is very dark and tough stuff to digest. But I'm glad people are waking up to these things. Um, yes, the videos you sent me recently, if you know who you are, those are pretty much on point. And the person sending the email about the, uh, uh, what do we say, agents and seeds of Satan and counterfeits, yes, you as well are pretty much on point, and I think you're getting what I'm putting out. If you've been with me since very early on when I was first ordained, even behind the pulpit at Grace Bible Church, where I was very careful, because um, it wasn't my pulpit, to put forth warnings about different things and tell people, listen, watch this movie, or why are so many children missing, or watch this, or be careful of that, and different things that I say that you think are just part of conspiracies. I think this year, the lessons and where the Spirit and the Scriptures are leading me, getting into counterfeits and agents and seeds of Satan and Nimrod, all these things we've covered in recent months, are starting to finally wake people up, um, and obviously the things that are going on out in the world. So, this is a year of revealing, obviously, I believe that. A lot of things going on. But, um, yes, to the three people, one sending me an email asking me questions about seeds of Satan and agents of Satan and different leaders and celebrities in the world and stuff like that. Yes, you're pretty much on point. And to the two people that sent me videos, I think you know who you are in the last five days, I guess six days. Yes, those videos are ones I'm very familiar with. So having said that, um, buckle up. What I can tell you, tough, it is tough stuff to digest. Why do you think I told people uh, the movie um, that came out with Jim Caviezel, uh, uh, Sound of Freedom, to go watch that, and then after you watch it and digest it, step back and realize he gave you this much of an iceberg that's this big. When I tell you he gave you the tippy tip tip of the iceberg, it's much bigger. Sound of freedom. And I've given you videos to watch and I've given you information. And I'm very careful because people get freaked out one or the other. They either get freaked out or they just go, oh, that pastor's into conspiracies. I'll go somewhere else. Okay. Do what you need to do. But having said that, yes, you people that have sent me the two videos and the email, you guys are spot on. You know exactly what... Um, Things I've been hinting to, and I'll try to carefully weave things into messages and let you know if you really follow the days of Noah I taught on recently and the seeds of Satan and the serpent culture and Nimrod and all these different things, you start waking up to these things. And you heard my terminology about blood, sex, money, magic recently um, in all of those things as well. Yes, there's a lot going on. And a lot of things happen behind the scenes with the very wealthy, very elite that run things. So, um, I believe the other movie I told you to watch one time is an old Stanley Kubrick movie. And that is called Eyes Wide Shut with a young Tom Cruise in it. That was like 1990s. And that, again, is just the tip of the iceberg. Anyhow, and the interesting title of the movie itself tells us what we live in. We walk around in every day with our eyes wide shut. Having said that, let's get ready to jump into it. The difference between the church and Israel is your lesson today. The difference between the church and Israel, lesson number 72, 2 Thessalonians, lesson number 72, 4, 16, 24 is your date. I want to jump into it. I had a doctor's appointment today and I had to run errands. I'm getting this message out late. I apologize. I normally get my messages out between 2 p.m. and 4.30 p.m. Eastern Time. You start to see my messages go on all the platforms. Rumble, YouTube, Brighteon, Facebook, prbministry.org. Go to my webpage, get familiar, it'll tell you all these things. When I'm running late and it's beyond 4.30, don't panic. 
The message is probably coming out there. It's just a day like today where I can't get the message out right away. And usually I'll get it out by 5, 30, 6 p.m. If it's not out by then, then there's a problem. Normally I would put a short message out and tell you I had some technical difficulties. Uh, the message will be out tomorrow or whatever. I normally put a short video out to let you know on all the platforms I can put it out on. So having said that, let's jump into it today. It is the difference between the church and Israel we are in. Open up today in Matthew, New Testament. Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16. Let's get ready to do the most important thing we do, which is get into the Word filled with the Spirit. Because in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory. Glory is the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And like newborn babes, long for that pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow in respect to your salvation. Let us prepare to take in the word of God in doing so. Let us get filled with the Spirit. New nature. How do you open it up? Filling power of the Spirit. Christ-like nature. Given to every believer at salvation. 1 John 1, 8, 9, and 10. The Apostle John tells us, believers, if we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves. The truth is not in us. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins, cleansing us from all unrighteousness, sins you've forgotten about or didn't know about. 1 John 1.10, the Apostle John says, Believers, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. His word is not in us. Take a moment of silent prayer. Name and sight any known sins, first and foremost. Get rid of the distractions. Get focused on the mind of Christ. And let us keep Israel and each other in prayer. So many things going on. And we will pray for the evil behind the scenes. And there's plenty of it. And people are finally picking up what's being put down over the years. Again, 2024 is going to be a tough year. I think 2024 going into 2025 for some people to digest exactly the evil that Satan has perpetrated on all of us. Every head is bowed. Every eye is closed. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time we have to come and study your word. And Father, we're lifting up this lost and dying world in prayer. And we're going to lift up those leaders, maybe even some of those that we know are probably involved in evil, Father. And they may be the agents of seeds of Satan. But maybe, Father, your word and your truth can touch them and they can turn and turn towards the justice system of God and make the adjustment to believe upon the one true Savior, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and come to believe and start living and teaching and walking in truth so they can touch others around them. Father, we're praying for our leaders that this light of the gospel and the light of your word fall upon them rapidly and open their eyes up. And Father, we're praying for one another in this little ministry and those positive believers and serious students that want to go forward and study your word and lift your word up into this lost and dying world because that's the biggest weapons we have is your word and studying and being accurate and strong and going forward in your word and being the example. Spiritual warriors, ambassadors, and believer priests. Father, we're praying for one another. We're praying for this lost and dying world. And again, Father, we're praying for, for protection of the land of Israel. Through your son's precious name, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us jump into it today. You guys are going to Matthew chapter 16. Today I want to show you the distinct differences between the church age we live in now and the nation of Israel. It's very important. Known in some circles, theologically wise, of the dispensation of Israel. And again, that is going to be a difficult um, theology to hang on to in the coming year or two years, I believe. When you start talking about the rapture and dispensations, people are going to try to find ways around that. And for a long time, there have been people that have tried to keep that cloaked in a lot of ways. So just understand that as well. So we're going to look at the distinct differences between the church age dispensation and the age of Israel dispensation. God never proclaimed the nation of Israel as his church. God called the dispensation of Israel his wife. There's a couple of scriptures referenced to that. 
marrying the land or married to, or children, or family in some scriptures. You can find those references, but not the church. We're very unique in the church age. His people in other scriptures. We're all God's people, really. It's just that the unbelievers have chosen to be on enemies of God. So you can find all of that in the Old Testament scriptures, but you don't find what we call the church in specific, what we talk about today, the church. Israel was never called the body or bride of Christ. Never specifically called out as the body and bride of Christ, the true Messiah. Nor was Israel called to be in Christ, in dwelling, never. Any other dispensation sect for the church age. Israel had a bloodline of priests that we know about. They did not have an individual priesthood. You have part of your calling in the church age. You have an individual priesthood. So there are distinct differences that most Christians had better realize. So you're not fooled because I'm telling you right now, and I've been kind of warning you, I think, in recent months. I believe, my personal belief, the easiest formation or the, uh, the, I guess, yes, the easiest formation of the one world order, I think, will be the banking system, because it's all digital now anyway. It's all numbers on a computer screen. It's all credit cards. It's all things that can be frozen and taken away from us. So the one world banking, I believe, is one step away. The one world government, people want to say, well, no, we're still free in America. I would challenge you, if you're old like me, you would look back and realize soft socialism took roots here a long time ago. Soft socialism. Which you have to introduce people to socialism, big brother, dependence on the government, the government being in your business more and more. Soft socialism was introduced here many, many years ago. I'd say in the 60s and 70s, and it's ballooned since then. So we're really one step away from becoming a type of communist nation here that just simply globs on to the rest of the communism, one world movement. But what I believe, my personal belief, is what we can see being built and that needs a little time to be built is the one world religion. That's what I believe needs more of Satan's attention and construction, the one world religion. I believe that because you got to get a lot of people under one roof. you got a lot of different beliefs out there. So what's one of the best ways to do it? Interfaith movements which I've talked about in the past couple of years with you. But these are just a few of the names here we're looking at as, as far as Israel and the church. These are just a few of the names used and obvious differences. And you better understand these things because these are the avenues that are going to be used to confuse Christians to fall under a new one world religious system. So these are just a few names used and obvious differences. We're called the sheep under Christ our good shepherd. Again, something really unique to our dispensation. We're called the true vines from the branch, Jesus Christ. Look at Matthew 16, 15. Pick it up in verse 15. We covered this statement in our Bible conference, actually. Many of you understand this if you've been with me in our Bible conference. But let's look at this again, Matthew 16, 15. Because he's getting to a point well, he's getting himself prepared for the cross, and he's teaching them, I have to go and I will come back. Don't worry about it, gentlemen. They didn't gather all this. They couldn't absorb all this. Many of the teachings that they got from Christ, even in his resurrected ministry, didn't fully digest into the 11 apostles until a period of time after his ascension and session. Obviously, the Spirit was upon them then, the indwelling. Matthew 16, 15. Jesus said to them, but who do you yourself say that I am? This is the foundational question in this section of Matthew 16. The question is, who do they believe he truly is? That is the foundation of the church. That's what he's, he's telling them. I'm the foundation of everything, but I'm certainly the foundation now of the church, what I'm building, what you gentlemen are, are commissioned to build for me. Matthew 16, 16, Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the true Messiah, the Son of the living God. Matthew 16, 17, and Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, which is 
re reference to his father's name, Peter's father's name, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father who's in heaven. In other words, you digested some of the Bible lessons. You've digested some of the Bible lessons. Matthew 16, 18. And I also say to you that you are Petros, Peter, a small one, little chip, little stone, little stone off the big stone. And upon this rock, what you just said, not upon you, Peter, Petra, upon this rock, Jesus Christ is saying, me, who I am, the Savior, Lord and Savior, upon me, I am the huge stone, the foundation, you're a little chip, Petra, Petra, two different words, even though we have denominations that try to build their leadership off of this falsely. Upon this rock, who I am, I will build my church. And the gates of Hades will not overpower it. In other words, all of these counterfeits, lies, and seeds, and agents of Satan I'm telling you about cannot overthrow the real truth if you're willing to understand it like they were at that time, even though they had levels of confusion. Peter's like all the apostles. A small chip or stone from the foundational rock Jesus Christ. Many of you understood this. I've talked this before. You better understand there is a difference between what he's saying, Petras and Petra. He's referencing himself, the big foundational rock. Peter's just a little chip, a little stone. And it's in the future tense. I'm going to build my church, future tense. That's what the church will be built upon. Not the apostles, even though they're important. Not any kind of building, not any kind of denomination. Jesus Christ, his mind, his word, faith alone in Christ alone, the truth of Jesus Christ. Like I tell you all the time, a lot of people can say, I believe in God. What God are they talking about? And when you get somebody that acts like they're religious or spiritual, because that's another avenue in the world, I'm spiritual. Talk about Jesus Christ as the only way, the only truth, the only light. And watch how spiritual and religious they are. Because he is it. Christ is the only avenue, amen? Faith alone in Christ alone. He's the narrow gate. Petra speaks to the foundation of not only the church, but the whole Christian way of life. He's the foundation. He's the ledge. He's the giant boulder, Jesus Christ, Petra. That's what he's saying in Matthew 16. Don't take it out of context like a religious system had way back when they knew what they were doing and built their leadership upon this. Peter's the first pope. No. In Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said, I will build my church. Since this is still future, when he made the statement, future searching finds the church beginning. If you keep searching what we're talking about, you find the beginning of the church, church age, on the day of Pentecost, seen in Acts chapter 2. Now, we know the pivotal point was the cross. That was like the stopping point, the interrupting point of the dispensation of Israel and the opening of the dispensation of the church. But truthfully, it kind of kicked off the day of Pentecost, Acts 2. The future tense Jesus used in reference to the church is definitive proof there was no church prior to this historic point. There was no church. You could use different terms like, well, there was a gathering in the Old Testament, or there was, you might want to call them a congregation or whatever. But we know the definition of a church. I'm building something new, and you guys are going to help build it for me. It's built on me, Jesus Christ. Jump over to Acts chapter 1, royal family. Jump over to Acts chapter 1. I think many of you, if you've been with me, especially during the last Bible conference here in Florida, I covered Matthew 16 pretty well, and I've done it before a few times because that's a very confusing point for denominational nonsense right there. The church age interrupting the dispensation of Israel was shrouded in a mystery. So was the rapture of the church. Many of you know this. If not, this is factual, and it's nothing new. A lot of things were shrouded or held off for a period of time in the Old Testament until the completed canon of Scripture. I don't know why that's such a big deal. And if you look at how many times, well over 21 or 22 times, I forgot, I think it's 25 or something like that, 
the word mystery shows up in the teaching of the New Testament. It must be important. Mystery doctrine. The church age interrupting the dispensation of Israel was shrouded in a mystery. So was the rapture of the church. Between the cross of Jesus Christ and the completed canon of Scripture, many mysteries and questions were open for all to see. Between the cross of Jesus Christ and the completed canon of Scripture, if you look at the time period, the day of the cross when Christ was crucified, and the time of the completed canon of Scripture, which many believe was 92 or 95 A.D., between the cross of Jesus Christ and the completed canon of Scripture, many mysteries and questions were open for all to see. Those believers in the Old Testament did not, they could not, fully grasp the completed canon of Scripture and all the questions and mysteries which would unfold at its completion. How could they understand all that? They got bits and pieces of prophecy because it wasn't complete yet. Not hard to understand. Not a big deal when we talk about mystery doctrine. People want to make it an issue like, you can't say that because that'll confuse people. There's no mystery in the Bible. There is mystery in the Bible. But a lot of it, all of it, that we need to know in this time, has been unveiled in the mind of Christ, the completed canon of Scripture. Those believers in the Old Testament did not fully grasp the completed canon of Scripture and all the questions and mysteries which would unfold at its completion. Look what Dr. Luke wrote concerning what was unveiled after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. After the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. This was not even the completed canon of Scripture yet. And at this point, mysteries were already opening up. Acts 1-3. To these he presented who? Jesus Christ. Resurrected. Also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, plural. Appearing to them over a period of 40 days. And 40 in the Bible almost always speaks to a completed cycle of God. A completed cycle in some form or fashion. Appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of things regarding the kingdom of God. And oftentimes when you hear about the kingdom of God, you have a piece of it in you right now because of our indwelling, but it also speaks to the coming kingdom of Christ. Thousand year millennial reign. The Greek present tense here, most of this is written in the present tense, Greek present tense, tells us that 40 days was a time of consistent teaching over and over again. Same style of teaching, which we now know revolved around what? Mystery doctrine. If you've been with me during the Matthew series, I covered this. I went over in detail in this. In fact, Go on prbministry.org. Rob is doing a lot of work there. He's opening up different pages with links all the way back to all my YouTube messages on Matthew. The whole series, you can find your way around. This all revolved around mystery doctrine. I covered this in the past. Those 40 days were a crash course for the 11 apostles on what the apostle Paul would later become the expert on. And it's funny. He was the expert on mystery doctrine, the master of mystery doctrine, and yet he was rejected by the apostles at first, the, first, the 11 apostles at first. It took him several years to warm up. <laughs> Paul had to work as a tent maker for quite a period of time because he had a struggle early on because of Saul of Tarsus. And that working two jobs trying to do ministry and tents wore him out. It caused him a lot of medical issues later in life. When our resurrected Lord was not appearing to crowds in the 40-day ministry, he was spending many, many intimate hours teaching the apostles. He dined with them regularly. They were getting a crash course on mystery doctrine. Acts 1-4, gathering them together, Jesus commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, you heard from me which was what? The coming Holy Spirit. All this stuff I've taught you for three and a half years, and now, during these 40 days, I'm giving you advanced eschatology on certain things. They're all going to come to fruition. You're going to understand this new church age you're responsible for, gentlemen. 
but you need the Spirit to help guide you. Acts 1.5 For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. There's only one baptism, folks. It is God the Holy Spirit. You're baptized into your union with Christ. You are identified with Christ. Now, water baptism for a short period of time in the early church made a difference with those who came forward because they were already believers and they were making a commitment. But water baptism is not the issue. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. As I've told you before, there's about seven baptisms in the Bible if you study them. So why don't if you want to make an issue out of water baptism, why don't you make an issue out of the other six baptisms? Why don't you bring those forth? Baptism of the Holy Spirit is very unique for the church age. Very unique for the church age. Holy Spirit power, we call it, in the Old Testament was specific for certain believers at certain points of time. The Spirit came upon them in a very unique way. Usually one out of a bunch as a leader who would speak the truth to the others. The Spirit came upon them. We're very unique in the church age. We're baptized by the Spirit. The formation of the body of Christ began at the day of Pentecost, which was not seen before in any other dispensation. There's a reason it was so unique, such a unique event to happen. Because it had to be the start of something new. Acts 1.6. So, when they had come together and they began asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time that you're restoring the kingdom of Israel? Because now they're starting to understand he's returned now to them, resurrection. So that starts to make sense to them. They're kind of, wow, we, he, said, he said he was going to do this. Here he is. And now he's ex explaining some end time events, church age events, mystery doctrine to them. And they're like, well, are you going to return right away? Is that when we can expect this? The amount of doctrine they received during the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ's resurrection ministry took several years, I guess, several years for it to fully sink in to these 11 apostles. They had to get a few years under their belt to fully digest all of what he gave them, this crash course of mystery doctrine during the 40 days. At this point, they had not received the filling power of the Holy Spirit either. So then they're like little kids. They don't get it yet. Some of the eschatology and mystery Jesus was speaking of left them concerned about times and dates. And isn't that just our nature? Times and dates. Acts 1-7. But Jesus said to them, It is not for you to know Periods, chronos, and epochs, appointed times, karyos, which the Father has set by his own authority, divine decree, eternity past. Pointing backward to the Father's plan, the divine decree, billions of years ago, already done. Chronological timetable set by God, chronos. This has to happen after this happens. Only he knows. We can gather some information on this and understand wide swaths or overviews or trends but every little detail in timing god knows chronological timetable set by god epoch in the original language that's what it says or dispensation that's what it means is a measured age or period with a definitive beginning and ending and i told you already the word dispensation just like rapture and trinity and a few other words that, that people want to argue over, aren't easily found in Scripture unless you know the original language and who's being spoken to and what Scriptures it's highlighting. You have to understand these things. But dispensation has to do with a piece of property. The best way I can describe it, how it was used in the ancient world, was a piece of property with boundaries. It had a fence all around it. Say it was a 10-acre farm. And there was a wealthy guy that said, this is my farm. I want you to take care of it. You're going to live within the framework and take care of this farm. But you have to stay within these boundaries. That's a dispensation, folks. Epoch or dispensation is a measured age or period of time with a definitive beginning and an ending. The original language has it written as times, chronos, and epochs, which is 
Kairos, Kairos, dispensations is another word for it. Jesus was not using the same word twice here. Times and times and times. It's not, it's not for you guys to know times and times and times. Jesus was no fool, amen? Jesus was not using the same word twice here, times and times. We get our word chronological, chronological order from the word chronos. And kairos, kairos, speaks to dispensations. Epochs and dispensations. The Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is telling them chronological events designed in eternity past, only the Father knows, will happen in specific order, little details we can't even understand. Then a new dispensation will occur. Let me say that again. The Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is telling them chronological events designed in eternity past will happen in specific, minute details, and they're going to happen in certain order, then a new dispensation will open up or occur. Definitive beginnings and endings. Only the Father knows. So keep watching the stars and the numerology and the prophets on YouTube, and they'll have it all figured out for you. Acts 1.8. But when you receive power... When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, gentlemen, you'll figure this all out. And you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria, across and as far as the remotest part of the earth, because today the teaching of the apostles and the touch of the apostles establishing a early church, a church of Jesus Christ, truthfully, first time in history, with the apostles at the lead, is going on today. Is it dwindling and being counterfeited? Absolutely. But it's here. I believe it's here right here, right now. But this is written future tense. The Holy Spirit will give them all power and insight like he always does when we're serious walking in a new nature and absorbing the word. Two power options. The indwelling of the Trinity and the power of the Spirit were never given Never given out to all believers before this historic point. In fact, it's not the same in the millennial reign. It's not the same in the tribulation period. Obviously, the tribulation sits by itself out there because it's a time owed to the dispensation of Israel. But future tense, this is written in. The Holy Spirit will give them all power and insight. The indwelling of the Trinity and the power of the Spirit were never given out to all believers before this historic point. That right there is a glaring difference between dispensation of Israel and the church. Go over to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians 3, royal family. There's a reason you want to get under a prepared pastor teacher. If not me, then find somebody else. But don't get yourself confused because there's a lot of confusing Confusion coming on the landscape. It's been around a long time. It is going to escalate. Just as we see the church age believers are called the body and bride of Christ, that never happened before in any other dispensation either. The body and bride of Christ. In fact, you guys are going to Ephesians 3. Let me put Ephesians 5, 23, 24 on the board. Apostle Paul teaching, again, the master the Paulinian doctrine is very important. You live in the church age, you better understand what Paul taught. You better understand what the New Testament highlights. Ephesians 5.23, For the husband is the head of the wife, analogy, as Christ also is the head of the church. He himself, being the Savior of the body, us, we're the body. Never before have these been connected to believers in any other dispensation he himself being the Savior of the body, verse 24, but as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives, there's a chain of command, authority, ought to be to their husbands and everything. The church is called the body. In several scriptures, I'm just showing you some examples. Many of you know this. The church is called the body and the bride of Christ, who is under the authority of Christ. He's the head. These were not used 
The Messiah, the reference to the coming Messiah in the Old Testament was not used in the similar fashion it's used here. Those who kick against teaching dispensations and the differences between Israel and the church are not accurately handling the word. And you know, I get people come and go all the time. I've had seven new subscribers, I think, on YouTube and maybe two or three on Rumble or Brighteon. And out of that 10 people, about six of them, I think, have stayed. There's been a couple I can tell that already bumped off. I can't tell exactly who. I just get, they, they send me these weird notices, new subscriber or unsubscribed or whatever. Sometimes they don't even tell you unsubscribe. And I know YouTube unsubscribes people all the time, so be careful of that one. Those who kick against teaching dispensations and the differences between Israel and the church are not accurately handling the word. You do not have to dig deep into Scripture to begin to see these things. Attempting to apply every command in Scripture from Genesis into Revelation becomes a journey into confusion and frustration. Let me say that again. Because those that are out there, and there's a lot of um, even journalists I like online, they're not mainstream people, that are believers, but when you talk about the rapture or dispensation or the church age, they're like, well, I don't know if I believe all that, but I believe the whole of the Bible. You've got to follow the Bible. Okay. Attempting to apply every command in Scripture from Genesis into Revelation becomes a journey into confusion and frustration. The dispensation of Israel were given the right amount of doctrine for the time that they lived in. We live in the dispensation of the full grace plan of God as being revealed in the completed canon of Scripture. So, the dispensation of Israel were given the right amount of doctrine for the time they lived in. We live in the dispensation of the full grace plan of God as being revealed in the completed canon of Scripture. The Apostle Paul is highlighting dispensations once again in Ephesians chapter 3. And that's not my lesson, so I'm not going to emphasize. But if you read the first couple of uh, verses right in Ephesians 3, 1 through 4, we're going to pick it up in verse 4. You'll see dispensations. It's used under another word, administrations. Ephesians 3, 4. Lesson for another day. Ephesians 3, 4. By referring to this... When you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ. What's he talking about? This dispensation and what's been left to me in charge of this fence area, plot of land dispensation. What's been charged to me is mystery doctrine. And especially with the Gentiles, because the church age is a time of predominantly Gentiles. Now, we have some Messianic Jews as well. Thank God, but mostly it's Gentiles in our age. Ephesians 3, 5. Now back then there was a lot more Jews that were coming to believe, but that faded. Ephesians 3, 5. Which in other generations, what's he talking about? It's another word for even saying another age, another epoch, another dispensation, was not made known to mankind as it has now been revealed to the holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. Meaning there were prophets back then because there were people designed, there was only a few, Day of Pentecost, it's believed they, uh, there's a handful that came out of that 120 that had some kind of gift of prophecy to help complete the canon of Scripture. That's it. That's a gift that's done away with. Mystery doctrine, which means church age teachings, would be revealed at the time of the apostles. There were temporary gifts in the early church. Some temporary things in the early church. Many of you know this if you've been with me. I explain these things. Mystery doctrine, which means church age teachings, would be revealed at the time of the apostles. Ephesians 3, 6. To be specific, even though that doesn't say it in the original language, he's emphasizing something. As part of this mystery, that the Gentiles, our fellow heirs and fellow members of the body, fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. In other words, Part of mystery doctrine is Gentiles are predominantly <laughs> going to be in the church age. This is part of the mystery that all nationalities, all cultures are on a level playing field 
once they believe upon Jesus Christ. That's what Paul's hinting to. Where the rubber meets the road. The Pastor Rick version. This is part of mystery doctrine that all nationalities, all cultures are on a level playing field once they believe upon Christ. This is not exclusive to the Jewish bloodline is what the Apostle Paul is emphasizing. Galatians 3.28. What does it say there? There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. Notice the distinctions here. And this is different, different dispensation than the dispensation of Israel, certainly in the Old Testament. Neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ. Jesus Christ is truly the one that liberated women, but they were still supposed to remain women. Lesson for another day. Verse 29, and if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise, singular. What did we look at recently? The three covenants I told you. One of them is singular, promise, covenant. If, first class condition in the Greek, meaning it's true. If, first class condition, if you belong to Christ, these things apply to you. You inherit the grace blessings, which is in Christ, Salvation was always faith in Christ, faith alone in Christ alone. I think most of you understand that. If you've never heard that, it's been faith alone in Christ alone since Jesus Christ, pre-incarnate, walked in the garden of the cool of the day, teaching Bible class to Adam and Eve. It's always been faith alone in Christ alone. Promise is singular here. Speaks to a covenant, promise, singular. The blessing of salvation through one who came from Abraham's lineage. If you've been with me the last couple messages, this makes sense. Promise is singular. The blessing of salvation through the one who came from Abraham's lineage. The church does not take on the Palestinian and Davidic covenants because Israel failed. Don't be fooled. The church does not take on the Palestinian and Davidic covenants because Israel failed. At the early formation of the church, many still promoted, very early on during this time, this is early in the formation of the church, at the early formation of the church, many still promoted the idea that the bloodline of the Jews who were believers were somehow head and shoulders above everybody else. That's one of the reasons that even old Peter would not sit and dine with Gentile believers for a period of time, and God had to give him a little wake up and shake up. At first, the 11 apostles were separating themselves from Gentile believers because they had Jewish blood, so they're so great above the Gentile believers. That's what that's about. There's no distinction, royal family. There's no distinction in the church age among believers as far as grace, gifts, and opportunities. Male or female, Jew or Gentile, get on the list, slave or free. That was all laid to rest at the cross of Jesus Christ, the opening of the church age. The one who split history, B.C. and A.D., Jesus Christ. Certain rituals and bloodlines had a place in the dispensation of Israel. Absolutely. That was no longer the case. In the dispensation of the church. That's why Paul and most of the apostles had to shake the stubbornness away from the Jewish believers because they kept thinking they're the ones blessed because Jesus Christ, obviously, of the bloodline of the tribe of Judah. Certain rituals and bloodlines had a place in the dispensation of Israel. That was no longer the case in the dispensation of the church. We are either believers or unbelievers. I tell people all the time. I even make jokes about it online on my Facebook where I get to, Richard, not PRB Ministry, <laughs> my personal Facebook where I get to be a little sarcastic and patriotic. But there's no such thing as race. Not, not how we know it. This spiritual race, I don't care where you're from. I don't care if you're from Europe or South America or Africa and your skin's darker or lighter than mine or whatever. They, they, we're, we're, there's one of two races you are. You're either a believer or an unbeliever. 
You're not a black American, you're not a white American, you're not an Irish American, you're not an, an African American, you're not you're you're a believer or an unbeliever. That's it, folks. Everything else is all window dressing. You are a believer or an unbeliever. That is it. Believers will be winners or losers in the end because there's equal privilege and equal opportunities in the plan of God. Do you know that equality does exist one moment of time? Equality exists one moment of time across the world. The moment of salvation. Equality exists. After that, everybody's going to take their equal opportunities and equal privileges given to them, all the same. Same 40 grace gifts, same salvation. And some are going to grow and some are going to reject. Some are going to go forward and fall back, go forward, backward, sideways. And others are going to eventually grow and there will be winners and losers in heaven. There is no equality in heaven. Equality is something people are striving for and it's used as a political weapon most of the time or a weapon to make somebody feel bad or guilty or whatever. But equality happened at the moment of salvation. You have equal privilege and equal opportunity inside the plan of God. And at the moment of salvation, you were all given equality. Everybody is going to grow at their own IQ, their own pace, really their own motivation. God looks at the heart. The Old Testament gives us prophetic scriptures on the death of Christ, his resurrection, many other prophecies pertaining future events you can find. The prophets covered a lot of that, but no information is given on his unique relationship with the church because they couldn't handle it at that time. They weren't ready for it, and God kept certain things shrouded. No information was given on his unique relationship with the church. The church is not revealed until the doctrine of the hypostatic union comes into fruition. That's when it opened up. Do you know what the hypostatic union is? If you haven't been with me, you would understand what it means. If not, maybe stick with me or go looking on prbministry.org, the third or fourth page of the website, and look for something like that in one of the videos. The church is not revealed until the doctrine of the hypostatic union comes into fruition. Even then, it was not fully taught until Christ was heading toward the cross. You start to see it in Matthew, what we looked at in Matthew 16. He started talking, you guys are going to form my church. We're going to build this. I'm the foundation. We're going to build on me. And you're going to go forward to something new, gentlemen. And you're going to establish something new. I'm going to give you just enough temporary gifts and power for a period of time to open this thing up and set the foundation. There was great clarity developed about the mission and the formation of Israel, starting right in the book of Genesis, beginning with the life of Abraham. It starts to become very clear. It's not hard to see. Great clarity developed about the mission and formation of Israel, starting in the book of Genesis, obviously then building from there, beginning with the life of Abraham. We just looked at some of the things, uh, uh, Genesis 12 and 15 and 17, I showed you. You could see the foundation. They were called to keep their national identity, their blessings or cursing, and they got plenty of both, <laughs> their blessing or cursing centered around the land, their descendants, and their treatment of the truth of Jesus Christ, evangelism. What did they do with the word? The most sacred thing God gave them. Their identity was woven into their worship system surrounding holy days and the temple, very exterior for a period of time to teach them what was coming and for us to look back upon and saying this is all true. Their identity was woven into their worship system surrounding holy days in the temple. We know that. We don't do any of that stuff. Again, unless you're reading your Bible from Genesis to Revelation and applying everything in there, you would have to do all those things as well. Because you can't skip anything. You can't just make it up and say, well, I'm going to skip this part and not that part. Not if, not if you don't understand dispensations and you want to look at the whole of the Bible. You're going to live in from Genesis to Revelation and apply all of that. Get back to me on that. Let me know how you make out. This points us to another distinction between two 
Israel and the church. This points us to another distinction between the two. Israel's worship was assigned to a set of rituals in only one place, the tabernacle and later the temple in Jerusalem. That was their assignment. The church, church age, is allowed to worship wherever two or three are gathered. The church didn't have to have a temple. Didn't need a tabernacle. The tabernacle and temple is in your soul structure at the moment of salvation. Something supernatural was built in there. It's an indwelling of the Trinity. But the church age, what does Matthew 18, 20 say? For where two or three have gathered together in my name, says who? Pastor Rick? No, Jesus Christ. I'm there in their midst. Even right now, using, taking advantage of the tech, technology God has given us, we're taking advantage of it in a good way. There's enough evil on this internet. But we're taking advantage of it a good way. Two or three are gathered. There's several of you watching these videos together or with other people, you don't even realize it. He's in our midst. There is no call for a temple. Jesus never made an issue out of buildings. He said, I'm the building, I'm the chief cornerstone. Wherever two or three are gathered in serious worship, studying his word, it is part of his body. Welcome to the body of Christ. Maybe you didn't know that. Cheers. You understand what dispensation you live in. If you need stained glass and big buildings and a thousand people there and a skinny jean pastor or some type of ritual coming from a leader with a funny hat, good luck with that because that's part of the counterfeit system. The early church didn't develop big buildings and denominational nonsense. The early church didn't, no call for it, develop big buildings and denominational nonsense. They gathered in people's homes for Bible study and worship. That's Christianity. Not religion. Counterfeits and then true Christianity. The church age believers are called into a faith rest application in relation to having a Sabbath. Another issue people are confused about. That's another distinction. The church age believers are called into application of faith rest, which you should be using all the time in relation to having a Sabbath. Another distinction. We also recognize Sunday as the day the Lord rose from that tomb. Therefore, the Saturday Sabbath is not mandatory in the church age. You could take Saturday if you want as a day of rest. God does want you to have a day of rest and time with your family and worship the things that uh, worship him and be appreciative of the things he gave you. Absolutely. It doesn't have to be a Saturday Sabbath. He was raised on a Sunday. And again, People look at Good Friday, they don't even understand that. You have to understand the calendar of the ancient times and the Jewish calendar, which mattered from sundown to sundown. And the day he would have been crucified on would have been the Passover into the next day. Sunday, late Saturday night, early Sunday morning, he arose. You should learn faith rest and apply it regularly. That's your Sabbath. And yet we have people arguing. I see them online. I get a kick out of them. You sh I, I only follow Yahweh and Yoshia. And they, and they get into all the Hebrew. That's good that you know all that. That's a good thing you know all of that. And I, and I practice a Saturday Sabbath. I'm sticking to all those. Things. Good for you. Go for it. You're so much closer to God than me. And you understand your Bible so well. The nation of Israel has rituals. Yes, they do. They did. The nation of Israel had rituals and outward expressions they were called into, absolutely. We have a more spiritual approach to our worship. In fact, I'd say, read Hebrews chapter 7. Here's a homework assignment for you. Hebrews chapter 7 tells us the priesthood has changed with the new eternal high priest, Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 2.5. Again, Distinct differences between Israel and the church. 1 Peter 2.5 You also, believers, church age, 
as living stones. You're the building. You're part of the building. You're being built up. You don't need stained glass windows. You're part of it. As a spiritual house for a holy priesthood, all believers, to offer spiritual sacrifices, says the Apostle Peter, that are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Through your union, your new nature, your Christ-like nature. This was an office for only the bloodline of Aaron. Many of you know this. How are you a priest? If you're studying and applying your Bible from Genesis to Revelation, how are you a priest? This was an office for only the bloodline of Aaron. That no longer matters in the church age. Other than God, I don't think you can truly trace the bloodline of Aaron. Don't worry, he's got it figured out. In fact, in the tribulation, there's going to be a lot of people surprised who the bloodline is. We are church age. We are church age dispensation, the believer priests. He's the high priest. Again, read Hebrews chapter 7. We live by the law of grace. We live by the law of grace. The plan of God is our law. Is it yours? Or do you have a bunch written down from the Old Testament? Because by the way, there's about 635 commands and laws you would have to follow. Again, get back to me. Let me know how you're making out with that. We live by the law of grace. The plan of God is our law. It is seen and studied in the completed canon of Scripture with a strong emphasis on New Testament doctrines, royal family. Romans 8, 2. For the law of the Spirit in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. You're not living in that age anymore. We're not called backward, folks, into the Mosaic law. We are not called backward into the Mosaic law, which Christ has already fulfilled. He either fulfilled it or he didn't. If you think he was half-stepping when he came, offered his life on the cross, again, get back to me on that. Let me know how you make it out. We're called forward into God's grace plan. Do you understand that? We're called forward into God's grace plan. The emphasis for the church age is to walk in the new nature. Walk in your Christ-like nature. You'll fulfill everything. He got it figured out for you. He did the work, amen? We reap the benefits. It's called grace. Be filled by the Holy Spirit is a command, not a suggestion. Ephesians 5.18, be filled by the Holy Spirit is a command, not a suggestion. I, and I would ask you, look how many times you see filled with the Spirit or by the Spirit or walking in the new nature. It's all the same thing. Put on the old new man, take off the old man. It's all the same thing. Getting ready to close, folks. This lesson today should give you enough difference between the church age and the dispensation of Israel that you don't get confused and buy the lie. The church age ends at the rapture. Our study in 1st and 2nd Thessalonians makes that very clear. Our study in the letters to Thessalonica make it pretty clear. The church age ends at the rapture. The dispensation of Israel is completed at the second advent when Christ steps down. Now, there is a regathering of Israel. A regathering Israel rejoices and celebrates during the thousand years of Christ on earth. That is the last dispensation that we know it. The millennial reign is the last dispensation. And in that dispensation of the millennial reign, yes, all the blessings and promises, anything owed to the Jews at that time, true 12 tribes of Israel, true bloodline, will be a regathering and a rejoicing and celebrating of all those things during the thousand years of Christ on earth. The church age believers are the first group to receive resurrected bodies. That's in scripture. The church goes in front of the Bema Seat judgment of Christ after the rapture. That's in scripture. Again, if you've been with me, these are simple to find. All of this can be found in the letters to the church at Corinth and the two letters to Thessalonica. All of this kind of stuff you, that I'm, I'm bringing up right here can be found in the teachings to the church at Corinth 
and the two letters to Thessalonica, and I would tell you obviously other places in the New Testament, but those are strong, easy ones to find in Corinth and Thessalonica, among a few other New Testament scriptures and books. These are all glaring differences between Israel and the church that are easily found in Scripture. And if you've been with me for a while, a lot of you are nodding your head saying, yeah, I remember Pastor Rick, you've taught on all these things before. The church age winners, folks, are given crowns, blessings, and rewards. Yeah, I have it right. I think I forgot to put church age winners on my notes. The church age winners are given crowns, blessings, and rewards, which carry on into the millennial, then into eternity. They can never perish all your crowns, blessings, and rewards. The church age has seven years of a wedding celebration during the seven years of tribulation. And it just so happens that seven days in the ancient world, a full week was the time they would celebrate for most Jewish weddings. Isn't that interesting? The church has seven years of a wedding celebration during the tribulation. The church age winners, what I believe... Ride back in glory with the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for the decimation of the Battle of Armageddon. Because you're winners. And you actually come down here with Christ during the thousand year reign. And you are given certain towns or cities that you will help monitor over as leaders. Part of your blessings, crowns, and rewards. And I believe that may even carry into eternity as you are heads over certain things. Plant crowns, blessings, and rewards do not perish. So they continue from the millennial reign into eternity. Again, I thank you for your time. Every head is bowed. Every eye is closed. Father, bless this message. Take it out to a lost and dying world. Through your son's precious name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.